On this podcast, we're going to talk about exercise-related case reports, so real patients, real experiences, and kind of what happens when they go into the hospital or the clinic. Um, they're mystery cases. And so what I do is I present the case piecemeal to Dr. Baraki, uh, and then he's got to basically guess. And, and the cool thing is it allows him to flex his diagnostic acumen, whatever. And the cool thing for us is we get to see like his thought process and uh, maybe uncover some clinical pearls along the way. Case number two. 45-year-old man with no past medical history presents to the emergency, depart emergency department with chest pain that started about an hour ago. He describes a popping sensation in his chest while doing dumbbell bench press with 80 pounds in each hand, followed by a sensation of electric shock, as he describes it, going from his chest to his legs that was accompanied with a transient bilateral loss of vision he thinks lasted about 30 seconds. Then he had lightheadedness, sweating, headache, and what he describes as heavy pressure in his neck, chest, and back. He denies trauma or any other recent injury. He denies the use of drugs or anabolic steroids. And he denies the history of a connective tissue disease or active heart disease. So uh, from there, Austin, any, any thoughts? Yeah, uh, a lot here. That's a lot of symptoms you listed. And so we talked a little bit about this on a previous one where it's like, gosh, they're giving me all this stuff. How do I pull it all together? So it sounds like we have a case of acute chest pain um, in the context of exercise, but this electric shock from the chest to the legs is a very bizarre symptom. So I'm going to just kind of like set that one to the side for a little bit. That one doesn't really like localize to any pathology that we Pan routinely body see. Shocks. Yeah. Transient loss of vision in both eyes, pretty alarming, um, but can happen for, you know, not as emergent, not, not so emergent type reasons. So I'm going to you know, keep that one kind of in between. And then lightheadedness, sweating, headache, pressure in the neck, chest, and back. Lightheadedness and sweating, I'm also not going to pay a ton of attention to just because a lot of things can can cause that. There's not a lot of diagnostic specificity there. Uh, headache may be related. I'm also putting that kind of together with my loss of vision in the in-between category. And then heavy pressure in neck, chest, and back in the context of somebody with acute chest pain uh, is pretty concerning. And so when we think about uh, backing all the way up to just chest pain. You know, there are a handful of emergency causes of chest pain that, you know, every, you know, medical student, probably by the time they're a second year medical student, definitely by the time they're a third year medical student, get grilled on a ton. So what are the emergencies with respect to the heart? You can have what you know you would hear of as a heart attack or an acute coronary syndrome uh, you can have uh, an aortic dissection you can have something called heart cardiac tamponade some fluid accumulation around the heart and a few other things in the lungs you can have things like a blood clot a pulmonary embolism you can have a pneumothorax which we've had in one of our previous um, uh, cases a collapsed lung you can have a rupture or a perforation of your esophagus as another type of emergency and there there are a couple other things that we you know tend to think about in just about every case of chest pain it's like all right convince yourself it's not any of these things. And then if it's not, then you can breathe and move on. So take a good history, get some vital signs, get an EKG, probably get a chest x-ray or uh, um, on your patient, and you can rule out uh, actually a fair amount of those of those things in, in pretty short order. And so in this case of acute chest pain in a 45-year-old guy associated with exertion, and then he also has some neurological symptoms, so the loss of vision, and then this kind of pretty distributed uh, symptom of pain, pressure in the neck, chest, and back, all of that is something that could be very, very compatible with an aortic dissection. And so that's my immediate first priority and first concern is to look for and rule out. So getting a set of vital signs on this patient right away, getting an EKG right away, and getting him into the, getting him into a, a, a CT angio of the aorta to look for a dissection would be my top uh, first priorities here. All right. Well, as you are a holistic practitioner, you actually went and laid eyes on the patient first. Uh, so he appears anxious, sitting upright in bed. He's on room air. Uh, and the case report actually said, and I quote, the patient was well hypertrophied. Uh, he was 6'1", 210. So, was, you know, I, if I could aspire for any one descriptor in my medical chart, it would be <laughs> well hypertrophied or well muscled. So just uh, heads up. Uh, his vital signs were significant for a blood pressure of 99 over 45. He was afebrile, so no fever. His respiratory rate was 15 uh, respirations per minute. He's on room air, satting 97%. His physical exam was otherwise unremarkable. However, it was significant for diminished pulses in his right upper and lower extremities. Now, on laboratory analysis, his white blood cells were elevated to 12.1, but otherwise he had a normal, complete blood, blood count. His troponin I 
was 0.26. This is an enzyme that's predominantly in the heart muscle. His creatinine was also elevated to 1.7 to speak to his jackitude. Yeah, he lives. Uh, he lifts probably. <laughs> his uh, EKG was normal. His chest x-ray was also normal. And he had a CT of his head and neck, which was also normal. Any additional thoughts before we move on to uh, some addis- additional testing? Um, I was curious. I don't think you mentioned any uh, any new murmurs um, on the on the heart exam. That's something that can be a, a source of concern. Whether they put an ultrasound on his heart, I'm still concerned about something going on with his uh, aorta, and so uh, I would not have uh, limited my CT scan to just his head and neck. The neck part can catch some of the upper aspects of the aorta. Um, uh, I, you know, but they also may not have appropriately contrasted that CT scan to look for the vessels at well. It could have been a non-contrasted head CT and soft tissue of the neck or something like that, which would be incorrect in this situation. <laughs> yeah. It was interesting that there was no, they did not detail an actual cardiac exam from on the physical exam, which yeah. one of the pearls that stands out to me from my time in medical training was that whatever you think the organ system is where this is likely to be localized, that has to be the most robust aspect of your physical exam, right? If you're worried about heart stuff, like I need to know everything about the heart. If you're worried (laughs) about lung stuff, I need to know everything about the lungs, right? And like, if you presented to an attending, if I, if you were my attending and I was an intern or a med stud and I presented this, you'd be like, yeah, what about the heart exam, dude? Right. Yeah. I mean, the concerning element of this case, you mentioned a couple concerning aside from the symptoms, but on the objective findings, he has low blood pressure, which is uh, concerning. Uh, He, you know, he may be in either already in shock or in impending shock. And then the asymmetry in the pulse exam, you noticed uh, diminished pulses in the right side of the body compared with the left. And again, that points towards a potential vascular type of uh, complication. The idea that we have diminished pulses in both the right arm and the right leg, but not on the other side is, I will say, a bit unusual. Um, but I'm still mostly concerned about something vascular going on here. And so uh, an, an angio uh, scan of his aorta and probably taking a closer look at his heart potentially with an ultrasound real quick, if I can, to look for you know, a new effusion, new aortic regurgitation, something like that would all be p- uh, potential things to look at. Yep. So he had a a cardiac catheterization was performed, revealed a swirling pattern and delayed washout of contrast. So indicative of potentially a false lumen, according to the read. He also had a CT angiogram that showed a type A aortic dissection from the aortic root all the way down to the abdomen. And then he had uh, an echocardiogram, so ultrasound done, uh, that revealed a rupture of the left coronary cusp and his ejection fraction was 40 to 45%. The diagnosis here was a type A aortic dissection, which, uh, you know, I got to say, right after the initial presentation, you're like, I'm really worried about aortic dissection. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's a no miss diagnosis. And this is a pretty, I would say, a pretty clear syndrome, uh, you know, concerning for that. You know, if if it had just been the guy came in with chest pain for an hour and he said, I I felt this popping when I was benching, most people would probably say, ah, maybe some kind of like a, you know, a little rib something or other, some little muscle soft tissue strain or something. But when I hear a syndrome of chest pain together with neurological symptoms, that definitely raises concern for dissection because that dissection can extend and impair blood flow up to your brain. But also if there's this distributed discomfort, neck, chest, and back, because the aorta goes, you know, it goes out, it exits your heart and then it goes to the back of your chest cavity and it goes all the way down before it splits off to send the blood vessels down into your legs. And so that's why I'm not surprised that he had an extensive dissection all the way down because his symptoms were pretty extensive in that way. So this is one that definitely was like a, a diagnosis by history. I'm surprised he got a cardiac catheterization. This this sounds like a diagnosis that you could make immediately with a aorta, uh, um, a CT aorta, and then send them to a vascular surgeon. Yeah. Yeah. So, and speaking of that, he had an emergent repair with a graft and mechanical valve. He was bridged with heparin uh, to warfarin later. He was discharged on aspirin, warfarin, and metoprolol. That's a beta blocker. And one month uh, follow-up, he was asymptomatic with strong pulses bilaterally. So I wanted to talk about aortic dissection here a little bit and uh, talk about, um, you know, maybe the role of resistance training in folks with aortic dissection, because that's pretty interesting uh, sort of uh, uh, case. So the aorta, just for folks at home, if you have, if it's been a while since you took anatomy or unfamiliar with the anatomy, the aorta is a big muscular artery made up of three layers. It's got a tunica intima. That's a single layer of cells that line the vessel. There's a middle layer called the tunica media. This is a mix of muscle, collagen, and elastin. And then there's an outer layer called the tunica adventitia. This is loose connective tissue that basically anchors the aorta in place. 
Now, an aortic dissection occurs when the inner intima layer develops a tear that extends into the middle layer, the media, and this creates a false lumen, basically a false blood vessel tube, if you will. Now, blood flow into this false lumen can result into the spread or expansion of that lumen. It can go forward, that's called anterograde, towards other major vessels that come off the aorta, and also backwards. So that can go retrograde into the valve, into the root of the aorta itself, or even into the heart. Now, this was a type 1, okay, a type 1 aortic dissection. And that means it emerges from the ascending aorta, extends into the aortic arch, and often involves the distal segment of the aorta. This is the most common type of aortic dissection in younger population, those less than 40 years of age. This guy was 45, I believe. It's also the most serious form of aortic dissection. All right. And this can cause all sorts of problems, basically due to insufficient blood flow to organs, including the heart itself. This guy had a ruptured cusp, you know. Yeah, that, that's why I was curious about the murmur because it sounded like he did develop aortic regurgitation from rupturing a valve. This can also dissect into the pericardial space, and you can get blood filling your pericardial space. It can dissect into your coronaries, and you can get, you know, this, you know, basically a heart attack due to a dissection on top. You, know, you have multiple problems <laughs> for a, for a cardiologist and a cardiothoracic surgeon to deal with. This can get ugly pretty fast. High risk situation. Yeah. Yeah, fortunately, it's relatively rare, but it's hard to know for sure because most cases are made at autopsy, right? So a lot of these are asymptomatic, so people are just walking around uh, otherwise unaware that they have this and likely exercise. Some of those folks are probably exercising too. Um, There are a number of risk factors that have been well established. High blood pressure is associated with about 70 to 80% of cases. Also, things you classically learn are connective tissue diseases, so like Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, a number of other of these connective tissue diseases and genetic disorders. Uh, Age greater than 40 years, so 75% of cases occur in patients between ages 40 to 70. The use of illicit substances like cocaine, ecstasy, also anabolic steroids, having an aortic aneurysm before, the history of that, or, uh, or a history of aortic dissection, family history of aortic dissection, all this stuff can contribute. And there's a number of other causes, including like, what was it, tertiary syphilis, I think is like another cause. There's infectious can... aortitis. Yeah. And trauma is another one too. If you have like high speed penetrating trauma. Decel- deceleration injury and stuff like that can lead to traumatic aortic dissections as well. So lots of long yeah. list. But because this is the Barbell Medicine Podcast, we got to talk about resistance training. So the idea here is, is weightlifting a novel risk factor for aortic dissection, even in individuals without connective tissue diseases or cardiovascular risk factors? I don't know. And I think that's, you know, the potentially billion dollar question here. I mean, obviously there are plenty of people who lift weights who have other existing risk factors and like the inciting event may be like resistance training. That's just what they were doing. Um, Although interestingly, when you look at folks with this type of dissection, this type A dissection, the type of sport when it occurred with activity, you have a guess what was the most commonly played sport or activity uh, when people had this? Uh, I don't know, golf. (laughs) It was golf. 32%. (laughs) Look at that. (laughs) There you go. 32% of sports induced type A aortic dissections happened with golf, which was followed by swimming and cycling at 16% each. Weightlifting was after that at 12% and then dancing was 8%, you know, And, and I don't see the recommendation against like golf out there or swimming, or cycling, and certainly at dancing, like no one's saying, hey, you know, don't, you know, get it moving like a cyclone on the dance floor. <laughs> they're, they're not saying that, but but the recommendation against resistance training or strenuous exercise is yeah. kind of part of what would be considered guidelines. Yep. And patients do seem to report a kind of not only fear around exercise, but also the desire for more information. So uh, this one particular study kind of surveyed folks with a recent diagnosis of aortic dissection. 18% stated that their doctor did not talk to them about post-recovery exercise at all. 31% stated that their physicians were uncertain about the types of exercises they should or should not engage in, which, yeah, you could count me in that, although I would definitely talk about it. And then out of the entire sample size, 81% of patients stated that they wanted specific recommendations about what exercise regimens were safe. And so the result of this sort of desire for knowledge, but lack of knowledge being provided or, or at least recommendations, the result is typical. People exercise far less after this sort of event, which I think you could make the argument is net bad, right? Net, net bad, just lack of uh, or insufficient activity. So the current guidelines for an aortic dissection suggest that people should avoid strenuous resistance or isometric exercise and competitive sports. However, 
these guidelines are characterized by low levels of evidence, effectively saying, yeah, we don't really know, so it kind of made up. And this is also usually not considered in the context of the potential benefits from exercise, where regular exercise is known to prevent and reduce high blood pressure uh, in addition to other potential risk factors here. Uh, so it's important, I think everyone would agree that it's important for folks with aortic dissection to not have a sedentary lifestyle, uh, but also potentially reduce the risk of further aortic dissection growth or potential like risk factors that would uh, encourage a either uh, uh, some sort of symptoms or sequelae from that. So this creates a difficult paradox for clinicians, I think. You're like, well, we want our folks to be active. We want the patients to be active. We want to reduce the risk going forward. But like, how can we do that? Because we're afraid that this dissection is going to grow if we just turn these folks loose and let them do whatever. Um, I don't know. Do you have a, a sense of like, I don't know, how you would navigate that sort of paradox or that sort of difficult situation? Uh, in a made up way. And I would be clear about that up front. I mean, I, I've, I've thought about this myself. Like what, if I were to suffer such a thing, how would I go about my like life and training afterwards? And it would admittedly look different, not based be on strong evidence that it should look different, but yeah, there's going to be some apprehension about pushing max effort stuff. If I know that I have that, you know, vulnerability in my aor aorta. Now, if you go to the other end of the spectrum and you become so completely physically inactive, then you might have a beautiful intact aorta and aortic graft after your surgery, but you might die of coronary disease and atherosclerosis, or you might mm -hmm. get sarcopenia and osteopenia and then have fall and have a hip fracture and die prematurely or something like that. So you might be trading off one thing for the other, even though admittedly the aortic dissection is the much more like acutely life-threatening sort of thing compared to those other ones, you might die a, a longer, slower death those other ways than you would from, from a dissection. So it is a tricky thing, but you know, if I were to go through that situation, I've, I've had some like consults with, you know, with patients who had, um, I'm trying to think, maybe one or two post aortic dissection, but some with other types like cerebrovascular dissections in the in the brain vessels, um, or or other so sorts of um, syndromes like that, that were advised similarly to to you know just like take it easy, and, it and easy, they're man. like they're like in their 30s or 40s or something. It's like what how do I, how do I do this? So we d you know have a discussion about what's important to them, potential benefits, potential risks. You know uh, what are they willing? You know what sorts of theoretical risks? If we don't know the absolute risks, are they willing to to engage? In? And then we come up with a very gradually graded sort uh, sort of exercise plan that you know. Is it necessary to start it out at that dose and grade it in the way that we come up with? Not based on any evidence that's made up, but it's something that provides a gentle entry point to activity that they feel comfortable doing, giving them time to adapt in theory, giving them time to, if there's any sort of a symptom that, you know, comes up that concerns them, they can, you know, get it, get it checked out. Um, and then, you know, put a cap on the top end intensity unfortunately, pro probably indefinitely um, uh, for them, be it, you know, RPE based uh, uh, caps or, or, or something like that long term. That's something that I've worked through on an individual basis. So I've had, you know, one guy I remember with like a vertebral artery dissection and didn't really know where to start. Uh, and so we just came up with like a super, you know, started out with some body weight type calisthenic stuff, even though he had been a lifter and then incorporated, turn it into like a goblet squat and then some like light machine work. And we just said, Hey, why don't we just set an RPE cap here um, for the foreseeable future? Let's see, give it some time, see how you do. And then, you know, if all things go well and you're wanting to, you know, bump it up a tiny bit, then that's going to be a decision that you're able to make for yourself. And, you know, there might be some theoretical risk. There might be some benefit, you know, that's up to you to make that, uh, that, that weighting in terms of how much benefit you feel you get out of pushing an extra rep um, compared with whatever theoretical risk they may be. I wish it wasn't so murky, but uh, is what it is. So that's kind of how I've gone about that in consults with people. Yeah, a number, a number of, uh, they're not guidelines to be clear, but, you know, sort of opinion pieces at the tacked onto the end of these like systematic reviews of the available evidence. And just to be clear, the available evidence on this stuff is not great. Uh, in fact, maybe the only sort of related case or, or sort of pathology that has at least some evidence in humans and exercise is the uh, bicuspid uh, aortic valve, valve sort of did. Yeah. And so basically that shows that those who exercise even strenuously, there's no like additional growth or like disease progression in folks who are exercising versus not, but that's only two longitudinal studies. And I think the sample size in both were, you know, 50 or so. So it's not like overwhelming stuff, slam dunk, like move on. Everything else is either in mice or just, you know, theoretical type stuff. And so what people will tack on, what researchers and clinicians will tack on to these sort of systematic reviews is this idea that, uh, well, if we cap blood pressure response to exercise, that's our sort of upper bound. And there's, it's, 
you know, all made up, right? But the 200 millimeters of mercury systolic, like that's our upper cap, should be good there. And it's like, okay, so folks are wearing like an ambulatory blood pressure monitoring device or something. And like they can associate that with a particular exercise and a particular rep scheme and particular RPE. Like maybe that's like an intelligent way to do this, but I actually think that's mostly soothing for the clinician. They're like I'm doing stuff, I'm doing science. We got numbers, we got whatever. Yeah, I don't know that that's like actually hard. helpful. It does feel like we're treating ourselves uh, quite a bit yeah. with those, those sorts of things. Yeah. I mean, it is unequivocally true uh, that such patients should have like super aggressive blood pressure control, chronically speaking, like at their resting blood pressure, yeah. which we've talked about a ton before, the difference between resting blood pressure and exercise related blood pressure and things like that. So they should have, you know, really nice low blood pressures, you know, in their day to day life and things like that. But when it comes to exertion and activity, I mean, is there some theoretical reason why keeping it not as high maybe uh tough to yeah. prove and and that data that type of data is going to be pretty messy particularly if you do it as you said with an ambulatory you know sort of because that's like a cuff that inflates intermittently if you don't have like an arterial line for continuous monitoring which then you run into issues of like is it properly leveled and zeroed and all sorts of other yeah. mess that comes into that data interpretation <laughs> I started thinking about, you know, where people could go awry here, like what would I feel like would significantly increase risk. It, and I think about stuff like incorporating blood flow restriction training in these populations, particularly in the upper extremities, would be generally bad or wearing like knee wraps, for example, or like a lot of isometrically based training, things like that. Uh, but as far as like, is it okay to squat? Well, I think it's okay to squat in some fashion, but I don't know, you know, What's the RP cap that's appropriate? Is it four? Is it five? Is it seven? Uh, you know, and then there's a cardiovascular response to higher rep ranges because it's more conditioning based. And so, look, do we keep the reps lower, but then it's heavier? It's like, it's all, man. It's all messy, man. Very tough scenario. I don't know what I would yeah. do if I had a giant aortic dissection from stem to stern, but well, <laughs> I'd be, I don't know I'd be scared. You, that's for sure. I don't know. You weren't there yet, but uh, when we worked, when I worked at a previous, for a previous company, I was doing seminars you know, uh, on the intake form, uh, like when you show up to the seminar, you have, Hey, do you have any medical problems? Just as like, it's supposed to be like a CYA thing, you know, cover your butt and, and figure out like, Hey, does somebody have like an absolute contraindication to exercise? Now this particular person was like, Oh yeah, I've got an ascending, ascending aortic, uh, aneurysm. And, uh, the, per the guy in charge was like, Hey, can you, uh, you would talk to this guy? Just be like, what, <laughs> what's up, man? I went and talked to this guy. I was like, Hey, um, uh, I noticed that you, you had said that you had an ascending aortic aneurysm, like any any thoughts on like what you're cleared to do, what you're going to do this weekend or whatever? He's like, oh yeah, my cardiologist and I have an agreement. It says that if I die, you know, while I'm lifting weights or whatever, that I can't, you know, hold him responsible. <laughs> 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 and, and so I don't, I don't, you know, this is obviously can be serious, especially if you're the individual, like if yeah. we're, you know, but. I just want to impress upon folks that, yeah, unfortunately, there are some unknowns, and this is going to be an individualized sort of uh, decision making shared plan you come up with uh, based on, you know, known and unknown risks and known and unknown benefits. And yeah. that's as best as I can do in a podcast. Agree. So. All right, you're two for two.